Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at Perry Miniatures Prussians. So, I think it was a few months ago now, Perry came out with these uh, Franco-Prussian war stuff. Uh, and they've just released the French. Um, they just put them up for pre-order. I think the box comes out next week. Uh, and I don't know anything about the Franco-Prussian War beyond the fact that the uh, French had a revolution in the middle of it, changed their form of government, and they kept fighting uh, and eventually lost. Um, Prussia is the military juggernaut running through Europe at this time, picking fights with pretty much everybody. But uh, that's about the extent of my Franco-Prussian War knowledge. So this, uh, this project's going to be a bit of a... A learning experience uh, as well which is going to be fun but uh, I thought I got two boxes of these I got the skirmish boxes you can see there so I thought I would do a quick unboxing something I haven't done before but I just play around with it um, so let's let's take a look at what's in the box um, first look at the box itself uh, it's your standard Perry miniatures stuff it's got the nice artwork on the front um, these are handy I find to have hanging around so that when you're painting miniatures you can sort of have a quick reference guide uh, normally I like to watch a movie or something or, or do a bit of audiobook reading or doing something else on a, on a computer screen when I'm painting miniatures and switching back and forth between tabs can be a bit annoying so having a box with a nice artwork on the front is always good uh, let's flip it over and have a look at the back So this is the skirmish box. There's two boxes. There's the skirmish box, and I think the other one's called the advancing box. Uh, I picked up two skirmish boxes, um, most because I'm using this for sharp practice, which Two Fat Lardies came out with a, a rules adaptation for in their 2022 uh, Lardy magazine. Um, anyway, a uh, little bit of brief historical background on the back. Um, mostly, there's that's your diagram for building the miniatures. Uh, and as someone who built, uh, well, 39 of them today... I can tell you it's pretty straightforward. I mean, all Perry miniatures are pretty straightforward. Uh, you put the head in the spot where the head goes. You put the arms in the spot where the arms go. Um, the shoulder, the uh, the blanket roll is pretty straightforward as well. You just kind of glue it on there. There's no, as far as I can tell, there's no uh, allocated blanket roll um, per figure. There's no body A goes with blanket A. It's all pretty straightforward. Um, you get a nice little... Uh, um, on the back here, you've got a nice little example of uniforms. It's always really good to have multiple directions. I'm sorry, I've got a light here that I'm trying to focus without putting glare on the box. Um, <coughs> it's always good to have sort of side, back, and front. Because sometimes you can find really good pictures from the front and the back, but not from the sides. And you're looking for the color of like this specific canteen um, here. And you're like, what color is that? And you just can't see it from the back picture here. It's sort of like, is that just an outline of it? And on the front, it's hidden, but uh, those side pictures can be handy. Um, and obviously, you've got the bedroll and the great coat wrap there. Uh, it comes with four different heads. So you get the, the sort of forage cap type head, uh, the Landwehr head, uh, the 1867 pattern, and the 1860 pattern. And so you can build, yeah, Landwehr and your normal line troops out of this box. And uh, you can also build grenadiers if you're particularly skilled. Uh, I think it's what the inlace, inlet sheet says because you've got to carve a little star on top of it. Anyway, uh, you get 39 figures in the box. You actually get 44 figures in the box if you include the four, uh, sorry, the five casualty figures, uh, which I don't, <laughs> but they're nice. Uh, the casualty figures are really cool. They're just extras, so I'll be, I'll be using them for something, probably shock markers or something like that. So let's, uh, let's actually crack open the box and take a look. So the first thing you get in all Perry Miniatures boxes is classic, well, almost all, is this classic green uh, sprue of of bases, which I immediately always throw away or use for uh, random bits of terrain or something like that. Um, I, I'm going to base it on 25 mil rounds, even if I was going to base it on on 40 mil squares or 60 by 30s or something like that. Some sort of uh, mass battle type basing. Uh, these bases here don't really work. There's only one sprue of them. I'm not sure why they still put them in the box. I should, but they just sort of have a bunch laying around. They're just getting rid of them. Um, so yeah, there's the, the sprue of bases. Now, for somebody who doesn't really know anything about this period, this, this sheet was my, my primer introduction, I suppose you could call it. Um, the introductory Prussian line infantry law sheet, if you like, 
um, goes through a bunch here of general breakdown, goes through the organization of different regiments, um, what how many men are in a unit, what types of units they are. Obviously, you've got the grenadier regiments, you've got uh, battalions of grenadiers, and then a battalion of fusiliers. It goes through the uniform, which is very interesting. Uh, basically talking about how everyone wore the same uniform, going through the different headgear. The headgear was particularly useful because I uh, I want to do these ones for the Franco-Prussian War, so I'm like, oh, well, I'll have to put the 1867 head on. Uh, but then you read there, uh, the, uh, the 1860 was still in use at the time. It just wasn't being uh, manufactured. So I thought, oh, well, I'll put the 1860 on, then they can fight the Austrians in 1866. And you've got, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, I think it's 1866. And you've got the Danes also they can go up against. So the, uh, the more variety, the better as far as I'm concerned. So the, the little inlet sheet is really useful. Uh, it also has these cool, big color pictures of, of the uniforms, which are also really handy. When just, uh, it goes on inside here. I, I won't adjust the zoom so you can read it, but it goes on to basically go through all the different, uh, the buttons of this color, the, the belts of this color. For the grenadiers, they're white uh, or black. I can't remember what, which, but it, 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 so it's similar to how they did it in the Pol Napoleonic Prussians as well. Um, th this is really cool. I like these. My favorite one they've done is for the American War of Independence uh, Continental Army Box, which is basically just this sheet, but it's all different small uh, jackets. And basically the point of the thing is to say that um, the good luck painting an actual uniform, just kind of do whatever you want. Uh, but it runs down here through. You get the regimental distinctions and that sort of stuff. Just regimental colors for different facings so you don't have to go trousing through a bunch of internet sites to find the right... Uh, regimental color to paint your your epaulette type things uh for the british there's there's websites for it but uh i haven't tried the rabbit hole of uh franco-prussian uh slash prussian war type stuff prussian wars uh, uniforms uh, and then they go through here and tell you the the regimental flags they've included them here but they go on to say that some of the flags were actually completely destroyed in tatters um since they've been around for about 40 or 50 years at this point so you know, feel free to just have a, a raggedy old flag on the pole there and uh, a good picture of a bugler there, which is always handy to have, um, especially if you come from the sort of British painting background that I come from, where you've got inverted colours. It's nice to see that uh, you, don't, you don't have to go mucking around and you can just paint everything the same colour at the same time. Now, the back of this is probably the most important for the majority of people, um, in that you've got your command frame build guide. This is the the only build guide you get beyond the one on the back there. It's very, very straightforward, as all Perry stuff basically is. Um, you've got your musician here, your bugler, your standard bearer, <coughs> which is there. Uh, you don't glue the final on until you've already built the, the standard, if you're going to put the flag on there. You've got a drummer and then an officer. So there's no NCO, which I was sort of a bit disappointed that you couldn't make an NCO, but I'm just going to make one out of some of the spare bodies I've got in there. Uh, I can, I'm, it's pretty simple to make uh, non-commissioned officers really um, so I bought two boxes you get one command frame per box uh, which is really all you'll need uh, if you need more officers just buy the blister pack that comes with officers in it um, the rest of the range isn't fully fleshed out at the moment but it's still a new range and honestly if you're doing a sharp practice force two officers uh, and a senior NCO should be all you need that's your you can do a level three and then two level two leaders, maybe two NCOs to give you a, a level one leader as well. You've got your musicians. Standard bearer is always good for um, deployment points. Um, not always use them in game, but they make nice uh, jump, uh, jump off points is deployment points. Uh, you've got your helmets, your different types of hats, uh, so headgear and helmets. So you can run them as, as anything you like. Pistol and sword option there. Uh, and... So that's the command frame. Let's have a look at the actual sprues in the box. So that's your, your pile of box sprues. Um, there's the command frame there. So let's have a look at him individually. I'm trying to find a way to put light on this that doesn't <laughs> just make it all reflective and shiny. But essentially you've got your sort of forage cap type hat, uh, type headgear here. Uh, your 1860 patterns, they've got the, the main difference, it's got this big metal thing down the back, um, which you could maybe mistake that for some sort of sprue flash or something like that, but that's uh, that's part of the helmet. Your standard with your with your hand there, so that's that's it's all very, very straightforward. Um, so you've got your, your, your bugler, 
standard bearer, drummer, and then officer body at the end there, and the officer head with the officer's arms and that's that sort of stuff here. I like that they've kept all this in one sort of space. So there's my officer space there, my drummer space here. It's all contained. Um, one of the annoying things is when this arm is actually meant for this model, but this arm is over here, and you've got to move around the sprue, but they really did a good job. There's obviously spaces in the sprue where they could have put different arms for a few other things. They could have had some more officer arms or something like that, or some alternative arms for some of these figures. But really, you can do anything you need with, with this sprue and the other sprues that come in the kit. Uh, so there's not really a need to, to go chucking a bunch of extra stuff in here. Uh, you want an officer with a pistol, you have an officer with a pistol. You want one with a sword, you have one with a sword. Um, you can make a few different poses out of those four arms there. So even if you built uh, three or four officers, because you could buy extra command sprues from, from Perry, uh, you'd, you'd still have them looking different. Um, and you only need the one flag per, per battalion, so you don't need too many of those. So I, I'm, I'm quite happy with this command sprue here. One of the things that sort of made me not really want to do the Prussians, that sort of put me off a little bit, was all these bed rolls. Um, they they kind of look good on, on, you know, American Civil War Confederates. But I thought it's it's a little strange to have uh, bed rolls on these proper troops, um, quote unquote proper troops. You know, you've got even an officer with a bed roll over here on the side, over there. But uh, the more the more I look at it, the more they sort of grow on me a little bit. Uh, and I, I think they're gonna they're gonna look nice once they're painted up. So we'll we'll see how they work. Now, there's two types of sprues, and depending on which box you get, you get uh, five of one and two of the other. So in the advancing box, you get five advancing sprues, so 25 advancing figures, and 10 skirmishing sprues, uh, 10 skirmishing figures on two sprues. So let's have a look at the uh, advancing sprue first. It should be on camera there. So the advancing sprue comes with uh, five sort of at the trail. I think there's another word for it, but I, I, I'd call this trail arms, channeling my sort of American War of Independence knowledge there, and then shoulder arms on the other side. One thing I found really cool, and the reason I built mine the way I did, is you can see these uh, these arms here are sort of holding, it's not a bayonet, it's almost like a, it's an extra sword by the looks of it. It seems the Prussians were still doing that old school thing of you give the infantry a sword, um, which I, I would give you cool points for, uh, although it's not, a, it's not the best use of resources or time or um, soldier carry weight to give someone a sword, as well as giving them a bayonet. Um, anyway. That's probably the clearest one there. You can see they're sort of holding it. Uh, it hangs down from the left uh, the left uh, waist there. The same place a bayonet would normally be on a sort of a British type, British or French troop. Well, most troops carry it on the back left. Uh, and so they're, they're holding it while they're advancing forward, which is cool. Uh, and then shoulder arms over here, which is a classic. Uh, this is more sort of you're building a battalion type thing. You'd have these, uh, which is why in the advancing box, you get five sets of these to make 25. Uh, and you've got five walking sort of standing walking poses with uh, five of each type of head um, so you've got your nine, uh, 1860 pattern 67 landwehr and the forage caps uh, they each seem to come with um, three bare faces one beard and one mustache which is cool these are interesting so yeah these are interesting here so when, I'll turn the sprue over and you'll see but you'll see it's got the uh, the bedroll sculpted onto the figure but it hasn't got it on the back um, I can't figure out why i imagine it's a it's a sprue issue of of molding but they've actually got detail on the back that gets covered up by the bedroll which probably just goes to show that uh the, the perry's probably sculpted these figures and then added the bedrolls on after um which is why they've covered up some of the detail but we'll have a look at that uh these spare sort of sword scabbards are for the uh the shoulder arms rifles uh because these ones are going to built into the arm so everything on this sprue You'll either use all of these or all of these or a mix of the two. I went for, for these ones uh, because I think it's more skirmish game-esque running along like that rather than marching like that. Um, so you use all the bodies, sets of the heads. So you'll have three sets of heads left over, uh, which are, which is always handy to have these heads here. Um, who knows what you could do with these. I'm sure you could do some cool sci-fi soldier conversion things. Yeah, you can do a bunch of... You could do all sorts of things. Um... Put some, put some German Landwehr type heads on some colonial troops and, and have a bit of a what-if imagination type fight in Africa somewhere. 
yeah, um, these are very useful. Uh, people love pickle halves too. So with uh, with three D printing, I'm sure you can three D print yourself up some some nice bodies and throw them on some some troops. But who knows? I I personally am just going to put them in storage and see what I find it useful for them. But people always like spare heads, and and I'm one of them. I think it's it's always good to have a bunch of spare heads. Uh, spare arms are nice, but not as useful. But let's flip them over, and I'll show you the back of the figure, and you'll see how the uh, the bedroll attaches. I'm trying to get away with this light. Um, you'll see there; it's actually got. I don't know if you can see it actually, but you should be able to see there that there's two straps. Um, I imagine one of them's a canteen, and the other one's a bread bag, uh, since that's what's attached to the uh, the thing here, or haversack type thing. Uh, these get glued on the back of here, which is what makes me think that they sculpted this before they decided to put bed rolls on everybody. Um, although these, these straps do help glue attachment on there. Um, lining them up at the two join points is pretty critical. There's a, there's a join point here, and there's one up on the shoulder there where the bed roll sort of comes together. Uh, getting that right is probably going to be the main thing. If it hangs off the body a little bit, then that's just sort of movement and, and just how it is. But uh, making sure those points are connected seems to be the main thing. Uh, I did find it much easier to put the bedroll on before building the rest of the figure. So clean it all up, put the bedrolls on. They don't aren't matched to particular figures as far as I can uh, found. Unless I got lucky every single time and I matched the exact one to the exact same thing all the time. Uh, but generally I found it much easier to glue them all together uh, before going and putting the arms on. Uh, another thing, once I was putting the arms on, I found that since I couldn't get a top-down view... Uh, I had to double check uh, each time to make sure that I hadn't pushed the arm too far forward so that it was flush with the front but sometimes it was sticking out a bit of the back I just needed to nudge it a little bit so that it wasn't overhanging too much and I think I ended up sort of coming to the idea that because I couldn't look down from the top and uh, get a judgement the way I would with some other figures because of this sort of tied off um, bit of the uh, ba uh, the bedroll was more important to, to double check these stuff with the glue um, before putting them aside. Although with plastic glue, it's fairly easy to, to fiddle with it before it, it's completely uh, gone and set. So uh, there's two of those sprues in the kit. They're identical. If you buy the other kit, there's five of them. Um, so this is the skirmish kit, so there's only two. Let's take a look at the skirmish sprues. So here are the skirmish sprues. You get five of these, and these are slightly better value, in my opinion, because you get uh, the dead Prussian there. Um, so you get five dead Prussians in the skirmish box. Same deal with the bedrolls. You've got the bedroll there that you glue on the miniature. You get two kneeling figures, which is nice. And you get a bunch of these. Um, you get two, three, f I think you get, you get three aiming rifles. So you've got, uh, oh, sorry, two aiming rifles there and there got one cycling a bolt, one going into a, an ammunition pouch, and then sort of two ready, and that one's sort of uh, also ready. Your same heads, your Landwehr, forage caps, 1860, 1867 heads. Um, these are all in skirmish poses, obviously. It's a skirmish set. So you've got guys sort of at, at the ready. Um, I couldn't tell you the Prussian military drill terms for this sort of thing. Uh, you don't get the two different options you do with the advancing set. So with the advancing sprue you had at the shoulder or at shoulder shift, or whatever the Prussians called it, or um, sort of trail arms. In this you've just got a mix of uh, loading, aiming, uh, at the ready, preparing to fire. And then you also get this cool, which I think is always great to have, uh, a spare rifle. This is a spare rifle in the kit, which you can do with as you please. Uh, I'm going to use that to convert up a, an NCO out of some of the other minis later. Anyway. Um, it, it's it's a nice little kit. It's it's really hard to, to say anything else about it. I suppose uh, the mini's all nice. There's very very little sculpting uh, issues. There's very little flash to clean off that you can't just take off with the back of a, a blade or something. Um, the legs have all got piping on the uh, the uniforms have this red line of piping down the side. So even if there is a little bit of sprue there that you miss, it'll just look like it was meant to be there. Uh, importantly, make sure these two sort of sword scabbards go on the two kneeling troops. Uh, the guys who are standing up, I've got them pre-sculpted, but the kneelers need them. Uh, and once again, I would, I would recommend putting the bedroll on 
before putting on the uh, rifle arms. I'm always looking. I'm looking for a lot of variety, so I basically uh, mix it up as much as I could. I took out all of the bodies one by one and put arms on them uh, in sort of a batch system, so that I managed to make all the poses slightly different. Uh, so, for example, the kneeling poses are mostly focused on on uh, mostly firing. Uh, the standing up poses I focus mostly on the, the sort of loading and at the ready, but uh, mix it up a little bit so there's a few kneeling loading and a few standing firing, uh, just to just to create a bit of that uh, dynamism and action. Because uh, I'm going to base these on 25 mil bases and put them on movement trays for sharp practice. So it, yeah, just to to make it look a bit less homogeneous, blocky, uh, mix them up a little bit. Uh, the dead Prussian is. Uh, is very reminiscent of the the dead uh, American of the dead uh, continental and crown soldier that you get with the Perry miniatures American War of Independence kits uh, and that you get a dead figure although in those kits it was on the command sprue and in these kits it's on the skirmish sprue so if you buy the skirmish box you get five and if you buy the advancing box you get two slightly better value for money uh, if you have any use for the dead figure so I was thinking of a few things, you use it to make a shock counter, uh, put it on a, a base and have a little spot for a dice next to it that you could put a dice in to calculate shock. Um, the sort of person that I game with mostly for sharp practice has little shock counters already on little dials, so I don't think I'll use him for that. Um, certainly could be used as a part of a medic uh, uh, scenic base for a jump off point or an objective which is what I've done for my uh, Sudan, uh, Sudan stuff, for the British in the Sudan. So these are these are quite useful. I'll, I'll never throw away a medic, uh, a, a sort of casualty figure. And one thing I was I was thinking of, what I would use the casualty figures to test out paint schemes. So I'll do the first paint, um, first model, instead of doing a test model, I'll do a test casualty figure. And that should be uh, enough to make me happy with the way that they look. I can I can sort of compare it to other things and maybe I need to change the tone of blue I'm using or uh, highlight in a specific area a little bit more. So I'll use the casualty to work out paint schemes, which I think is a really cool, which I think is probably the best way to go forward with this one, uh, using it to test out paint schemes. Because uh, one of the things I just like, I love to do a test model. And one of the things I dislike though is that the test model sometimes looks a bit different. Um, because you change something or you do it a different way or when you're batch painting you look different to when you paint individually um, but to have a test model that's not going to see tabletop use I think is a, is a going to be a bit of a, a different experience and one I'm sort of looking forward to doing a bit more experimenting with um, these these rifle arms are quite good uh, they, they look quite detailed they've got these little balls at the end of the muskets they just come right off uh, I would definitely advise with the Perry stuff clipping it out with a pair of clippers instead of busting it off with your fingers. Um, the ones you can take off with your fingers are the, the heads because they're one attachment point is at the bottom and you can clip away that neck area because it's a ball socket joint type thing. Uh, I would definitely recommend being very careful with the arms because uh, as I learned in the past you have to be quite careful when shaving down the uh, especially the ones that are like the where are we this where you can see the sprue joins the shoulder there. If you cut that at a weird angle, you're going to get a, uh, a guy with a shoulder that's got a big line at the back of it. So be be careful when you cut out the uh, the arms, especially ones like this and like this. The flat area is not so much. You can sort of get away with it. Uh, and as a general rule, I clip the uh, the bottom of the stock first, the, the sprue to stock, cut that first, because sometimes the, the link between the sort of uh, trigger assembly area and the uh, sort of breech trigger and the stock can be a bit weak where that hand guard is I uh, sorry where the hand hand uh, isn't there so in a place like this um, where you've just got bolt stock and then a little flimsy piece of plastic there I'd recommend just gently clipping that first before taking off this sprue here um, Perry Perry sprues are all very similar uh, in that they're all similar sized rifles uh, which of a similar thickness, which uh, generally attaches the sprue in a similar way. So some like this, you could probably get off with your fingers, but I would just recommend clipping everything. Um, as you can see, that head there is trying to jump off the sprue. Uh, um, luckily, I'll be using that one myself. Um, these arms, make sure you keep them together. I should have them in frame. So this arm goes with this rifle. This arm goes with this rifle. 
I haven't tried mixing them up, but I, I don't think it would, would work. I think it might be a bit confusing. So just keep them together. This arm goes with here. It's very straightforward. That arm goes with there, this with here, this with here. So if you're going to do what I do and clip everything out, uh, maybe in batches of 10, I think I did batches of 10. Uh, I think 5, 10, 10 I did. Um, keep these two together and then keep these two together in the sort of two piles of, of four, um, if that makes sense. And I, I would recommend gluing the swords on first, just so you don't forget. Uh, and then you undercoat your models and suddenly you have to shave off a little bit of undercoat to put the swords on. Then you've got an unundercoated piece, which, yeah, it gets a bit silly. Anyway, uh, let me chuck the box back down and then have a little wrap up. So as you can see there, uh, the, the Perry's also do the advancing box, which looks like that, uh, with figures advancing, as you can see. Uh, and then they've got the Zulu war box next to it because the Zulu war box comes with, uh, I'm trying to get away the light. The Zulu Walk box comes with home service helmets uh, with a sort of different uh, pith. I think it's still a pith helmet. It, and I'll put a picture of it up here. Uh, different different helmet that the British were wearing in home service. The two, the two Fat Lardies magazine was interesting in that it came with... Uh, interesting in a weird way. In that it came with um, rules for Prussians versus British, but not Prussians versus French. Uh, which a lot of people on the forum, uh, on the Lardy forum and on the website seem to have... A lot. A few seem to have looked at and gone, oh, that's strange. Oh, that's strange. Why would you do the <laughs> the British? But apparently it's from a, a novel at the time, or it was a popular uh, sort of, the Prussians are coming, the Prussians are coming type opinion people had. Um, anyway, uh, I, it's not going to be too hard to make French rules uh, for, for the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and then you get to have the two different types of French, the Imperial French under Napoleon III, and uh, then, of course, the French of the, uh, the Third Republic. I think they're up to the Third Republic by that point. Um, and then, of course, you can play Maximilian uh, with, with some other French, which a friend and I do, but that's getting a bit off topic. Um, I, I'm very happy with these Prussian miniatures. I built a full box. I'll put some pictures up. I was very happy with the way they went together. They're very clean. Um, some Perry stuff can be a little uh, fiddly. Uh, their old British box set, in particular, had some odd poses. I should clarify that the old British Napoleonic box, which I think now is probably 10 or 15 years old, uh, maybe a bit older, uh, has some strange poses. Um, it's still probably the best one on the market, though. Um, I would I would definitely consider it one of the best. Um, although the Warlord Napoleonic uh, British box is actually uh, my my personal favourite. Again, I'm, I'm running on tangents here. Um, it's very good. I'm looking forward to getting the French box. The French box is going to be very unique. It's got the great coats. Uh, with the uh, the epaulets and that sort of thing that the French uniforms seem to have, have been drawn towards, uh, which we'll then see in the First World War as well, uh, a, a style of that. Um, and here we, we, we're seeing First World War images here too of these sort of German jackets that, that are going to be quite um, familiar to us. Uh, and obviously the pickle halves will be replaced uh, in 1916, yes. Or maybe even 1917 with the, uh, the, cold, the cold shorts helmet or whatever it is. Anyway, these... Prussians were very, very good to build. I look forward to playing sharp practice with them. And uh, it's this was not very much a planned thing. It was more thrown together at the last minute because I want to I want to build this box. Uh, but I also thought, oh, well, I might as well make a quick video of it just so that I can uh, chuck these guys out and, and, and tr test out making a unboxing video. Uh, my camera is currently balanced on the other box of Prussians. Because I couldn't find my tripod, so I'll, I'll work on getting a better camera set up for this uh, and a better pointer stick rather than an old brush. So thank you very much for watching. If you have any comments, any uh, recommended reading for Franco-Prussian War or just Prussian military in general, sort of that mid-19th century Prussian military, I'd be very interested in that. So if you could uh, pop that down in the comments. Uh, and if you are doing a uh, some Franco-Prussian War stuff, now that the Perrys have got plastics, or if you've done some in the past, I'd be very interested in seeing that. I'm especially interested in the cavalry, the Prussian cavalry, because I'm, I'm looking to see if I can do plastic conversions from Napoleonic cavalry, but I don't think I'll be able to get away with it. I think they're just a bit too different. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.